grumpy. <laughs> ah, well, you know. Hey, it's a show. It's this show. What's this show called? It's this the is back- the Backpack Show. I wouldn't blame you for forgetting. You have so many shows in your like StreamYard brand thingy that you could choose from. You know why I have so many shows uh, on my show with the StreamYard? Because it's so it's easy, really to easy to use. use. <laughs> you broke it on me, so StreamYard, get your own damn show. Whack. Okay, hey. there you go. One ad read out of the way. We did it. Oh, you're so funny. <sighs> Carrie, who's our guest today? Wouldn't you like to know? I would. <laughs> it is Janice Gassam Asari, PhD, the author of The Pink Elephant, A Practical Guide to Creating an Anti-Racist Organization. She also wrote Dirty Diversity, A Practical Guide to Foster an Equitable and Inclusive Workplace for All. And she has a podcast that I want to talk about. So lots of things. She's principal consultant and podcast host. You can find her at bwgbusinesssolutions.com. I'm way back on dirty. Um, I'm, I went right to you are dirty, a child. Dirty Diana. No, I went to Michael Jackson. Like an dirty eighth Diana. grader right now. Welcome to the Backpack Show with your host Chris Brogan and Carrie Gargone. Boom shakalaka. So my son streams on Twitch and last night I I gave a bunch of subs, like I bought a bunch of subs to gift. And so he was playing Minecraft. It's going ching, 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 ching. And he got distracted and he died. Oh, so bad. You're a bad mom. I'm a bad, I am a bad mother. (laughs) Oh, well. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Janice. Leslie and other Janice are here. Uh, We have our own Janice today. Um, but I'm going to read two more ads, and then we'll talk to our new friend. Choose wisely. Dr. Janice. Hmm. Two more ads. Choose wisely. Oh, she's so smart. I'm so excited about this. Hey, you know what show you can watch on Thursday? That's tomorrow, 10 a.m. Uh, Central Time. You can watch Intercultural Spark with Deanna Shas. Get some. Watch that show. It's a great show. It's worth it. Deanna brings a whole interesting and exciting pile of guests on and is an incredible interviewer. Get some really good insights from her guests. <sighs> I'll do this one. How about the <laughs> online domain dot online? You want your own dot online domain? You could have pink elephant dot online for one buck. Just use the code Chris, all caps at seabroken.me slash online. Get you some. <laughs> Best two ads. Yes. Now we can talk to Dr. Janice. Dr. Janice Gassimasari. Let's drag her in. We'll ask her a whole bunch of questions. Hey, Dr. Janice. Hey, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That was a super a long, unnecessary hey. How are you both doing this I evening? Think, I think it was a perfect hey, and I'm excited to be part of it. I'm not ready to, to discuss it. <laughs> well, so I think, well, the reason that I really wanted to talk to you, I'd come across your work on Twitter, and I think it's such important work. There's still a lot of people that are like, I'm not racist. And leaders in organizations are like, well, I'm not racist. And they don't necessarily see the difference between not being racist and being actively anti-racist and creating that type of organization. So what is the difference and how can people cultivate actively an anti-racist organization? Yeah, um, Carrie, I think that's a great question. And what I always tell leaders and and just people in general, um, because one question I get asked a lot uh, whenever I do work with companies is like, can you tell me if I'm being a good ally? And I have grown like disdain for this word ally because I always say like the focus is so much on like, am I doing the right things and not, am I supporting the most marginalized people? So I've like, even anti-racism as a term, I'm trying to move away from a little bit because I think it recenters the focus on the people we should not be focusing on. We should really be asking ourselves like, are we advocating for the most oppressed and the most marginalized people. So I think that it's a constant and ongoing question we have to be asking. What I find a lot of company leaders doing instead is saying, this is what we want. Uh, Tell us how you can help us implement it and not this is what our most marginalized employees actually need. So we see a lot of companies throwing tons of money, millions of dollars, for these different like initiatives. I'm not gonna name any names, but just putting millions of dollars toward these things. And I I always ask like, what are you actually doing for the employees? Because I see you have this apprenticeship program and this small business entrepreneurship grant. And I'm like, that's cool. 
but how are how is the environment you're creating within the company so i think we should be asking ourselves like who are the most marginalized in this workplace and what are we actually doing to support them janice let me go back and ask you a question about that because you're saying i, I i'm not disagreeing with what you're saying what i wonder is uh how do you get that info like th does a yeah. ceo go you seem marginalized why don't you tell me what you need? Like that doesn't yeah. seem like a good plan to me. Like how yeah. does that work? How do you how do you get that? Well, that's an excellent question. So in my book, I actually um, mentioned or referenced this amazing book, which I recommend everyone read, called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. She's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, and um, I think a lot of people know her because she was like on Oprah's book club or something. But um, she talked about within the U.S. how there's like a racial hierarchy. And if you think of the U.S. as like a caste system, similar to what India had, um, then if you look at who is at the top and the bottom of the hierarchy, uh, Black Americans are at the bottom, quote unquote, of the racial hierarchy. So based on that sort of understanding for U.S.-based companies, I would ask organizations to look at their Black employees specifically and think about what programs and policies have been implemented to support them specifically. What I hear a lot of leaders saying is, well, we don't want to alienate the other people, so we don't really want to focus too much on this population. And I'm like, one thing that's cool and interesting is if you have programs that support the most marginalized, everyone in the workplace will benefit. Like if you're like, we're going to put in a mentorship program, even if you're aiming to specifically help black women, for example, having a mentorship program will help everyone within the organization. So I think it's really important to be specific in the focus. But um, to answer your question, Chris, it sounds so simplistic, but like you wouldn't guess how many companies don't just ask, like, what is it that you want? Like, what, how can we support you? I think leaders hire me already knowing what they want. And they're like, yeah, we want you to do this. And we want you to do that. And I'm like, no, this is what you should actually do. Um, a lot of companies just, to me, it's just like hire folks like me, but don't want to listen to us. So I think the simplest thing you could do is ask the people within your workplace, what is it that you want? How do you want to feel supported? Um, what can we do? What policies can we implement? Besides everyone wants to get paid more. I think that's like the running theme is like pay us more. Um, but it's also like, do I have an equal opportunity to get promoted? Am I getting promoted at the same rates as my counterparts? Or am I getting, I am I in this position and I've been here for like 10 years in the same exact position? So I think asking the people within the company what they actually want without leaders assuming they know is is probably the best strategy. Chris, I don't know what you're laughing about because the people do that to you too. Like hire you and then don't listen to you. No, I, I totally love that. But I was I was actually I was just <laughs> laughing about the whole uh, like for instance, all the new chief diversity officers that oh, showed yeah. up. And and I know Jen is gonna know because this is her world, but like it's always, the, the analogy that comes to my head that made me giggle was that you know that Simpsons beginning where you see the Simpsons and Maggie is beeping yeah. the horn in the back and she's totally not yeah. doing it. That's chief <laughs> diversity officers, yeah, right? That is so true. That is so true. I love Simpsons, by the way, and it's funny because I went home to see my parents and I was watching it this this um, this week, and I literally grew up on that on that show. But yeah, it's it's like companies hire chief diversity officers and don't give them the tools that they need to succeed. Don't give them any power to actually make the changes. So a lot of it feels kind of performative where it's like, hey, we're going to bring this person in and say we're doing something, but we're actually not. Um, or we're not giving this person any sort of power to change things. Um, so we see this a lot, especially after companies do things and say things where they get themselves in trouble. They bring someone in, they bring someone on board. And then it's like, but what actually changes within those organizations? Not always a lot, um, but it, it gets people to kind of shut up if they see, oh, they just hired this person or they just brought this person on board. So a lot of performance going on. <laughs> Carrie has a thousand questions, but I have one that I, it's like I'm, it's like gonna poke through my chest like the movie Aliens. Um, <laughs> you said this early on, and I and I full on took the blow to my face, you know, because I like to say ally and stuff like that. When you said it, I was like, oh my gosh, she's so right. I'm an idiot. I get it. Uh, however, because we almost always have I thoughts in our head. If 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 you walk into a room full of people and you say people around here aren't eating healthy every single person in the room thinks I, I'm eating healthy, right? Like they, it, yeah. you go to you. Cause that's who you, that's who you kind of control. 
Now I'm like, I'm going to eat this brownie and I regret nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so You can watch me. Point. I'm going to enjoy this Cinnabon. <laughs> oh, we got to talk Cinnabons in a bit. So, but the, to, your, to your point, you know, the person comes at it thinking, I'm doing these things. I've got to do it. Me, 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 I, because that's all I can do. And, you know, I don't want to be a Karen or, or whatever. Right. But how do you help them? Cause your, your point was so valid. How do you help them realize we got to set this kind of pool up. You got to get outside of you. How do you help the people kind of get that past the you or do you, or, or what do you do? Are there exercises? How do you, when you get brought in, what do you do? I always ask people to explore like what, and I feel like this is another overused word that has sort of lost its meaning, but I always ask people to think about their privileges because even me as a black woman, I have privileges and I talk about them a lot. I talk about the fact that um, I'm lighter skinned. I'm a lighter skinned black person gives me privilege compared to a darker skinned black woman. Um, the fact that I, I have youth privilege somewhat, somewhat, but youth privilege in this country. I have, um, I took an implicit association test. Harvard has them on their website where you can take a bunch of tests to tell you if you have unconscious bias. I took one and it showed that I have a strong automatic preference toward thinner individuals, which I was surprised about because my weight has fluctuated my whole life. So I would have thought I would have taken it and shown no preference toward overweight or thin individuals, but it showed I had like a preference. Um, but even like in society, there's weight bias and, and in the workplace specifically, that's a big issue that we're not really, we don't talk about often. Um, but like I ask people to explore the ways that they have access and opportunities that maybe other people don't have. Um, and like people always ask me like, how can I use my, like, what can I do to be an ally? Now I always say, well, think, what are the, the ways you have access and opportunities that other people don't have? Sometimes people say, well, I don't know, you know, um, what can I do outside of like giving black people money? You know, someone had said to me outside of the context of capitalism, how do I support black people without like just saying, hey, hey, here's a bunch of money. And I said, well, we all have like six degrees of separation. So you can make an introduction on LinkedIn and you could say, hey, I see this person is looking for an accounting job. I could introduce this person to someone within my circle or my network who can possibly help them get a job. And that's something that's super duper simple. We probably don't even really think about it, but like even if you have 50 followers or 50 friends on LinkedIn, that's 50 people you could possibly introduce to somebody that might not know those people. And I know that like on LinkedIn in particular, we're really siloed. And like, if I'm black, I'm more likely to have black friends on LinkedIn. If you're white, you're more likely to. So like kind of breaking down those barriers is so important. So I think like first assessing and understanding ways that maybe you have benefit and privileges that other people don't have. And then asking yourself, like, how can I use these privileges that I have to impact people that don't have these privileges. Thank you. When we come back, we have so many more questions. When we come back, I you actually know. get to talk to you. Terry gets questions. <laughs> no, wait. I, I hogged the whole <laughs> beginning, but when we come back, we'll get to that. I'm going to put you backstage for just 35 seconds. Boop, just like that. Let's don't anyone go anywhere. It's 35 seconds, you freaks. All right. Hey. Someone freak. might be. Hey, do you like podcasts? Me too. Um, Castos.com. They're a host of podcasts. They host us. That's for sure. You would be no podcast. They host your night. podcast files and syndicate them to all the places people listen to them. Something, something peapods. All right. Did you ever want to use a search <laughs> engine that's not Google? Hey, me too. You know what you can do? You can just go to presearch.com. You don't have to give your attention to the man. You don't have to give your search data to the man. Give it to presearch. Uh, you can they're, earn they're, crypto for using that search engine. Something crypto, yes. So pre-search something you used it for weeks I and then it. realized I've you should have been logged in to get crypto. I, I haven't <laughs> stopped using it because I've actually come to prefer it. So, so there we go. That's it. That's all my ad reads. I'm grabbing her back. Okay. Welcome back, Doctor. All right. I have a question, Christopher. Sure. Uh by your leave. So I was just thinking that sometimes people feel in the workplace, maybe they just feel unsupported, but they don't necessarily know what kinds of things they would need to make things better. So if the organization asks people, and then they don't have concrete ideas, they, I would imagine, think, well, we're doing, you know, what we can, we're doing everything they want, because whatever, how can you give them ideas for things in a way that makes it sound like, um, like, you're not suggesting that they're deficient or ignorant but being like well you know sometimes people don't know what they need mm -hmm. like as far as like they know that they're not feeling unsupported or that they're feeling as though they're isolated or something 
but here's some ideas for things that have worked elsewhere. Like, how do you have that conversation when they, they're like, Hey, they're saying they're fine. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I give suggestions or I say, um, I had a conversation. I try to spin it around the folks that I talk to when I go into these companies. And I'll say, I had a conversation with one of the people on XYZ team. And they said that, um, they said that they feel like X, Y, and Z, you know, and that usually gets the leaders to be more open. But in all honesty, sometimes leaders don't listen to me. You know, I, I was doing a workshop um, several months back and we were talking about, um, what is it, employee referral programs. And, you know, a lot of companies have these refer referral programs where they're like, hey, refer your friends and um, we'll give you a sign on bonus or we'll give you some sort of bonus. And I shared with the people in the workshop, the CEO happened to be in the workshop. And I said, um, you want to, if you're looking for more diversity in your pipeline, you want to stay away from referral hiring because that tends to bring in a homogenous group of people in the workplace and doesn't add more diversity typically. And the CEO interrupted me in the middle of saying that and said, Janice, I can tell you right now, we're not gonna stop re doing referral hiring. And it was this like awkward moment where I just was like, okay, you, you're paying me, you brought me in to advise you, but you don't wanna listen and that's fine. You know, it's almost like you can bring a horse to the water, you can't make them drink it. And so there are those situations where people, the leaders think that they know better or they think that I've been doing this work for 30 years or I've been at this company for 20 years. I know better than this person who's coming from outside that doesn't know anything about our company. And that is absolutely true. You know the company, but I also write about these topics a lot. So I have to do a lot of research. So I know a lot of best practices. And the reason that these companies hire me is because they recognize this person studies the, this these things. This person is passionate about these things. Maybe we should take this person's advice, you would think, you know, but a lot of times, you know, companies are like, yeah, we're not going to do that. We're going to do things our own way. And I think that that's part of the problem. But sometimes companies I've worked with are very open to like listening to new ideas. So sometimes I, I inform them that it was, hey, one of your employees shared with me that they want an anonymous way to give feedback. That's something that mm. I don't see a lot is like anonymous feedback. So what about then having the conversation where this is hard to explain, but obviously if they're talking to you, they've reached a certain level of awareness that perhaps the boardroom is like blindingly white, right? They may not necessarily think they have a problem with referrals because they're like, I have lots of black friends. I have lots of, you know, Asian friends or whatever. They think they have a really diverse pool of people they hang out with and they really don't. So what do you do as far as getting them to look at their own hiring data and stuff like that? In the case, not like you want to argue with them, but to be like, hey, as like a ramp up to getting together, <laughs> take a look at your hiring trends or take a look at your promotions. Like, how do you get them to access some of the data they may have, but have never thought it necessary to look at? I always just ask them, like even things like exit interview data, there's so much information when people leave a company and they, they're honest and they're just like, I hate it here. It sucks. And it's like, I asked them, like, assuming that they already do it. And I'm like, when was the last time you um, reviewed survey interview or exit interview data? And a, a lot of times they're like, oh, we've never actually reviewed it. We just have, we do them, but we don't actually re review the data. So I think okay. when you say things like that, then they're open to like, oh, okay, maybe we should go back and check. Do they check the Glassdoor website? Because sometimes disgruntled employees past and current will write feedback in there. So like, I think making the suggestion, um, because oftentimes they're looking for someone to like provide guidance on like, what should we be looking at? We know like how many people are coming into our pipeline, but what else should we be looking at? And I'm like, look at your promotion rates. Um, because someone has shared with me, their company didn't have an issue with um, the Asian American Pacific Islander uh, population, they had representation, but what they were finding was that not a lot of the people from that community were ascending or were getting promoted in the workplace. So they were like, okay, we have this employee who's been here for 10 years, but she's literally been in the same position. So it's not a matter of like representation, for some companies, it's like people don't have an equal opportunity to advance or they're not given the tools or the support to actually advance. 
We had that on the show. We had a uh, uh, one example from Broadway, uh, Jesse Hooker Bailey, who is in the very popular uh, show. Oh my waitress. gosh, waitress, waitress. I don't know why I blanked on that for a second. And she was saying that there's sure a lot of people of color in uh, Broadway shows. If you look at the chorus, yeah, and the understudies, the, the understudies, yeah. the chorus, but never the yeah. leads. Sometimes yeah. the seconds. And we also had on uh, the the first black Anna on mm -hmm. uh, Frozen and whatnot, and mm -hmm. her name on Broadway. Name. But it was the same thing. So what what broke my heart about it was to hear Jesse saying, "Hey, listen, you know, I came out of the same." great schools and programs and stuff. I had all the same training and qualifications. Then, you know, white woman would get the lead instead of me. And I was like, maybe I need to work harder, go back to the drawing board, another vocal coach, coach, blah, blah, blah. And then again, understudy, understudy, understudy. And pretty soon that that person she graduated with had had like three lead roles under their belt or something. And she's still understudy, understudy, understudy. So it's perpetuated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even the yeah. qualifications are equal. Exactly. And there's a really good article that I would recommend from Harvard Business Review. It was written by um, this woman, Rashika, and I'm going to um, I'm going to mispronounce her last name. So I'll just give her first name. Um, but it has like a million uh, views on Harvard Business Review. And it's about how imposter syndrome is like it was like stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. And it was a really powerful piece about how like a lot of women are just told, oh, you know, like it's imposter syndrome when it's actually like, you know, women being told that they don't have the skills or being forced to believe that they're not adequate enough. And it's it's never really imposter syndrome. So I think it's like, well, you know, you just work a little bit harder and maybe for the next opportunity, you'll be able to get it. And it's like um, there's a situation with um Nicole Hannah Jones, I believe is her name, the woman who spearheaded the 1619 project, which is getting a lot of um, sort of backlash now. She was she's a university professor at UNC. She was up for tenure and they denied her tenure. Mind you, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and they denied her tenure. So it's like, what do you have to win the Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> like, And, and right. you know. People said, oh, well, maybe it's because she doesn't have a PhD. She has only a master's. And you look like, at the other people who had tenure? like Right, exactly. And it's like a lot of them don't have PhDs either. But it's like it's this idea that it's like, well, it's just imposter syndrome or, you know, work a little bit harder and you'll be able to achieve and, and get to that level. Um, and it's like, no, a lot of times it's just, of course, the systemic barriers that have, are in place and that exist. And I think like I'm glad we're having more of these conversations because I think um, the onus has been placed on like the people who are marginalized. Like we all know Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. And I think that we've kind of moved away from that where it's like, stop telling women they have to lean in and they have to like adopt these traits that men have to be successful. Why don't we tell these companies to stop choosing people that are crappy individuals to lead these companies? Absolutely. So it's interesting how many uh, circumstances this brings about. And, you know, we had mentioned an entertainment one and I was on my own. I was watching a, a, or, or not related to this topic. I was watching something on YouTube uh, about an hour or two ago and it was Jason Manzoukas, the actor. And he was saying he keeps, you know, even before he was kind of famous for what he's famous for now, uh, he was getting a lot of no's in TV commercials because they were saying, well, you know, we're kind of looking for like basic bland white dude. He's yeah. Greek. Jason Manzoukas is Greek. He goes, I am a white dude. He goes, yeah. well, but you're not like the plain white dude. Yeah. And so he was saying, like, they want oh. vanilla. They want vanilla. Yeah. They, yeah. they want little brads and stuff. Ambiguous. Right. Right. And and, uh, and then who's one, laughing and now? Right. He yeah. got he got um <laughs> he got brought into a scenario where uh, they cast him as an Indian guy, and he was just kind of going with it. And he got all the way to the last step, and they said, you're Indian, right? And he goes, no. <laughs> Man Manzukas, like yeah. not yeah. Indian. But anyway, I, I only brought it up as just a sort of side side dish to say that you know it's it's crazy when it happens. Your point about uh, lighter skin versus darker skin. Your uh, yeah. things that they've said to Serena Williams so many yeah. times, for instance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's crazy, and so it's just a, it's a it's a big cookie to eat. Yeah, and he keeps talking about segue. food. He said side dish. That's my <laughs> big segue into food, Janice. He knew he was going to talk about food. Let's talk about what it, what happened. What made uh, Cinnabons and cinnamon rolls in general your <laughs> thing? Um, I just have always had a sweet tooth. When I was young, my dad used to take us. So we lived in Northern Virginia, right outside D.C. And there was a grocery store called Safeway. And they used to have sugar donuts that were amazing. And my dad, every Saturday, used to take us to Safeway. 
to get sugar donuts. We used to do like the Tuesday night kids night at Pizza Hut. So I've always like had a like had a sweet tooth or loved um, and that's like my self care. And I don't live near a Cinnabon. So it's like really a treat for me when I get an opportunity to get a Cinnabon. But who doesn't love Cinnabons? You know, like, Harry and David will mail them to you, right? Yeah. I would love that. I, would love that. <laughs> I can get my email for a, a gift. Uh, I oh, love a gift code. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I love Cinnabons, but I feel like Cinnabons make people happy. When you walk into a mall and they have a Cinnabon, you smell it from like a mile down. It's just a happy, like food makes me happy. <laughs> Even what the airport smells these? better. Like when they have a I was cinnamon. thinking about airports. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I was thinking about is O'Hare has uh, one particular spoke where the food is right next to the uh, terminals and there's mm -hmm. a Cinnabon there and you know they're killing every other. Oh, car and in um, Charlotte. Charlotte has like in their little. Um, You're right. And every time I walk in, I'm like, ah, Cinnabon. And they have one next to Annie, Annie Ann's on Annie's. The yeah. Pretzel. The pretzel one. She's not going to yeah. win. Yeah. She's not going <laughs> to win against that cinnamon war. I know. I know. Cinnabons are just, they just bring me joy. But you also cook, right? I saw that you're into, there's a specific kind of rice recipes you always look for. Yeah. So, well, I just learned how to make it a couple of years ago because my partner is from Ghana. So they eat in Ghana jollof rice. And that's not something I was familiar with or I knew how to like eat or, or you know, make. Um, and so I just looked up recipes online and it's essentially like a really, really spicy rice with a tomato sauce. And they add like goat meat. They add they can add chicken. They can add veggies. Um, so I'm not a big like I'll eat meat, but I'm not like it's it's not really my thing um you know but i love the way that the jollof rice tastes so i've tried to like perfect the recipe um and like it's really interesting because in west, oh, west African countries, people have like jollof rice wars so between ghana and nigeria there's like in a nigeria war. yeah who has the best jollof rice I, I mean, I'm biased because my partner is Ghanaian. I would say Ghana, but I know that there's there may be some Nigerians watching who who say that they hold the crown. Um, but well, it's really you know what the solution is, Janice? Have them send you off. some. Right. <laughs> Rice off. And see who, who makes it better. But you can like bake it too and like make it healthier. You can like tweak the recipe. So um, I'm just a food, anything with food. And I'm also not like a food snob because some people are like, oh, I don't eat this or I don't like, I'm not, I love coffee. I'm not a coffee snob. Uh, my sister's a coffee snob, uh, but I'm not like, I'm just like, uh, I'm really simple to please when it comes to food. Nothing wrong with that. You don't Nothing podcast about that. food though. The podcast is still diversity. So like when you yes. do your podcast. I, I do mention food because to me, food Ooh, is a really great is a West African dish where the rice Sorry. is cooked. In you, why are you watching about it back there? I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm already learned how to make this rice. What's matter with you? Gotta, look, pay attention. We're talking to Dr. Janice. You have to try it right it's now. Amazing. But I don't even know what that is. All together, everyone loves food. So, yeah. So they put tomato paste, lots of spices. Just don't try to take my food. I'll put a fork through your hands. <laughs> my food. <laughs> That's exactly Carrie. I'm in the same way. I'm so all my friends are like, oh, that looks really good. Maybe can, can I try? Some cake? Oh, I'm like, no, you freaking can't. You have the same menu I did. Yeah, I'm like, get your, your own. own. Get your own <laughs> Butterfinger. Do you, you all right? remember that commercial? Oh, yeah. Don't yeah. lay a finger on my Butterfinger. No, oh, or the Kit Kat, how you're supposed to like snap it off and share it. Yeah. I'm like, no freaking way. <laughs> like, um, so I'm an 11-year-old boy at heart, so I need to ask you what is Dirty diversity before we actually talk about your newer book, The Pink Elephant. Sure. So why is it dirty diversity? Hit me up. What's it mean? Why? That's a great question. So, uh, dirty diversity because uh, diversity in corporate America has become a dirty word. So, people feel a lot of disdain for the word diversity when they hear, oh, we're bringing in Dr. Janice to do a diversity training. People have this like, visceral reaction. So that is really why I named the podcast Dirty Diversity, because I feel like the word diversity has become sort of like a negative, has a negative connotation, especially in corporate America. 
Uh, that is a good enough answer for me. I, I wanted. So <laughs> were you hoping for? No, don't answer that. No, right. like dirty rice. I was going like dirty no. rice. I was thinking kind of like you know no. that sort of like spicy, spicy like jambalaya, diversity. like everything in the pot yeah, kind of a spicy thing. Like, you know. But I love one thing about me. I love alliteration because I feel like things are easier to remember when it's like a bunch of D's, dirty diversity or diversity dinner dialogue or what you know people will remember. So I yeah. like the alliteration. Uh, you obviously had to shut those down a little during the old ye old COVIDs. Are you planning mm. to pick up some of those dinners and workshops again soon? I am. So I'm glad you asked. I plan to, I have to just schedule it. Um, I was doing it in New York City and it was actually sponsored by Papa John's and they had brownies. They actually were bringing in like 20 boxes of pizza, brownies. They have these like marble cookie things. Um, which were amazing. So I'm planning on like finding a day in August, probably like midweek, like Wednesday or Thursday and, and having it, there was a studio right next to Times Square that I was able to do the events in. So I'm planning on bringing it back this August. So I'm excited. Oh, can I ask you a sort of tough question when it comes to that? Of course. Papa John's, uh, sort of semi super ultra famously CEO oh, issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but, but Shaquille O'Neal has a massive amount of investment in Papa John's and now Dr. Janice is working with him. Does yeah. that mean we're okay to buy Papa John's like hook us up here? That's a, no, that's an amazing question. And, um, so I'm connected with their chief or their former chief diversity officer. And two years ago when I started doing these like diversity dinner series, um, she reached out to me and she's like, so I wrote a semi scathing article about them. It wasn't a positive article. Right. She must have seen it. And then I said I was doing this event and I got a DM from her on LinkedIn. And she's like, hey, Papa John's would love to sponsor your event. And no. I was like, mm. and that was no. right then, like after the CEO, it's use the N word. And it was all of these things. And I was like, um, and then she, she, I spoke with her about all of the initiatives that they've introduced. And I felt better once I learned okay. what they were actually doing and cool. they've been sponsoring these events. So people in the New York city area can come together, can talk about how to create more equity and inclusion. Um, cause I do it as a free event. Um, and I just eat the cost of whatever the studio is. So I like that they're trying to right. make it better. Um, and then they added, uh, they have a chief branding officer who is actually Ghanaian, who they hired. Shaquille O'Neal, like you mentioned, is on the board. The CEO right. was on the board and then he stepped down. I don't know what role he's playing now. But so I think that they're slowly bouncing back or trying to bounce back. Um, and so, yeah, that was that's actually a great question. And I'm glad you asked that because at my very first event, I know that people were like, why did you go with Papa John's? And right. I was, well, that's a great question. And, and I spoke with the chief diversity officer and they're trying to, you know, she's trying to fix things and make the environment cool. better because the reality is there are people from, you know, there are black employees there um, because someone said to me, well, the solution is, all the people of color getting out of corporate America. And I said, yeah, that sounds nice, but that's not a reality. Everyone's not gonna like leave corporate America. So how do we create safe environments for those people? And if someone is brought in and is trying to do that, I'm open to like listening and seeing what they're actually trying to do. Like what's the alternative you. then? The alternative is for everybody to be like, no, you're canceled. We're not yeah. ever gonna have anything to do with you again. And they're like, all right, yeah. F it. I guess I'll just be racist, yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure it's easier. Exactly. And it's like, what do you do for the franchise owners who are like, so I, you know, I do, I'm like on the fence about cancel culture. I, I think people should be held accountable. Absolutely. Um, but I also think like sometimes we're quick to cancel people without giving them an opportunity to like redeem themselves. We've all made mistakes. Like I, I know I've said things that like are cringy looking back now we've all done that. So it's like, are we who like, it, are we not able to like learn from the things that we've done? So I'm just kind of like, is it a pattern of behavior over the course of years? Or is it someone did something and that was 20 years ago, they're apologetic. They've shown that they, have through their actions that they've changed and we're still gonna cancel and drag them. So I'm, that's part of the reason why I'm like, uh, Twitter makes me a little bit like, cause yeah. Twitter is one of those places, it doesn't matter if you deleted the tweets, they'll find them. They'll repost totally. that. And yeah. Well, you know, I got to remember to not make fun of people from Guam anymore. Damn it. Okay. Yeah. Can't do that to... anymore, Chris. Yeah. You gotta... 
It's too late. Yeah. Forget it. All right. Later. Oh, and here's our person of the day. Kaboom! I ask you to sign a ledger of everything you've ever said. <laughs> You're screwed. Yeah. yeah. I'm doomed. Mm -hmm. All right. Person of the day on the show today. Leslie, because I actually liked what she had to say about that. And she was talking about the fact that, you know, it seems mm. like a lot of people want to say that they checked the box. We brought in a Dr. Janice. We're good now. Yeah. We've been vaxxed. So exactly. we're not racist. Vaxxed Check. and vaxxed. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Janice was here. She left. Now we're good. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we have a question we've asked every guest we've ever asked on the show. Five-time beatbox champion, Butterscotch. We've asked Horacio Garcia Rojas from the Netflix show Diablero. Fun. And now we've asked you, what goes in your backpack? It could be something physical. It could be something metaphorical. Carrie, what's something physical someone could throw in a backpack? A bottle of whiskey. I like whiskey. <laughs> whiskey or maybe or an avocado. Cinnabon. <laughs> a yeah. Cinnabon. Or it yeah. could be something metaphorical. What's a good metaphorical one, Carrie? Probably kindness. You need more of it. Kindness is a good one. Yeah. Dr. Janice Gassimasari, what goes in the backpack? I would say optimism. I, I try to be a really optimistic person. And I, I know that like these systemic barriers exist. Racism exists. But I try to move in life feeling like I can actually make a change and being optimistic about that. Because people tell me, all the time that like things are going to stay the same and I'm not going to make a change. And why do I even put any effort into it? Um, so I would say like, I try to remain optimistic no matter what. Um, I say optimism is my superpower. Um, so I would say optimism and probably like Cinnabons as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like the package. Yeah. I, like the package. I think that's going to work out rather well. So, you know, Leslie, you could either have a, a, <laughs> uh, a really good apple because you know it's the backpack's your yeah, ways well, to get you an apple. Sure. Or you could put it in a pie, that's what I say. Could be yeah. a Cinnabon. And so, they have you know. ice cream. Um, Ben and Jerry's has Cinnabon ice cream. Mm. The options are unlimited. <laughs> well, if you go do something like that, there's a recipe my grandmother used to have. It would involve Cinnabons and apples, and it worked kind of like. Uh,